All right, well, welcome to class again. We're going to cover some more of what's on our seminar part 4B, uh, lies in the textbooks, only now we're up to the point of what do we do about it? Okay, it's obvious there are lots of things in the textbooks that just simply are not true. What do we do about it? Some practical steps to how to fix the problem. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, our job is to be the salt of the earth. You know, salt is amazing. Salt irritates. If nobody's irritated at you, at you you're probably not a very good Christian. Salt flavors. Our job is to bring out the best, you know, you put salt on to bring out the flavor in things, and we should bring out the best in, in people and in our neighborhoods and in our churches and in our schools. We should uh, truly be the salt of the earth. Salt also preserves from corruption. And if there's corruption in your school or corruption in your textbook, our job is to help preserve the community from that. We should do something about it. So our job is to be the salt of the earth. Now, I would have to say, in my experience, I would say most of the teachers that I know, and I know many public school teachers, my brother, 34 years, he led me to the Lord, he's been teaching public school for 34 years, uh, my mother retired from teaching public school. Most of the teachers that I know are sincere, dedicated professionals. They are not the enemy, okay? They are often put in a position where they have to work with curriculum that is just corrupt because the decision of what they get to teach from is made years before. And we'll get into more of that in a minute. So many of them teach evolution because that's all they've ever been taught. They simply don't know any better. And a lot of them don't realize they can teach creation science if they want. They've been taught you cannot teach creation science, but that simply is not true. Let me give you a little bit of the history behind this. First of all, it is perfectly fine for a teacher to teach creation science in a public school if they want to. Back in the 1800s, the average textbook taught about creation. Oh, got brand new chalk here. Good. Um, if you got a textbook from the 1800s, you would see that they taught uh, creation. They taught the earth is six days or six six thousand years old, roughly, or was created in 4,000 BC, and it was done in six days. They taught the Bible story. Then, from 1800, actually, the 1836, I believe, is when the first public schools really got going. Sometime in the early 1800s, and I think they started in Massachusetts, if I recall. But uh, and they taught the Bible as their curriculum. Up until about 1925, when a very famous trial took place, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, the Scopes Monkey Trial, as it has come to be known as, and I've got the whole court case right here in front of us. The, up until this time, creation was taught right from the Bible. Teacher would get up in class, they would read the Bible story, they would discuss it, and kids would be tested on it. What happened? In 1925, several states passed laws outlawing or banning evolution. One was called the Butler Act. The Butler Act passed, I think it passed in 1925. The Butler Act became uh, law in Tennessee. This was the law that was challenged by the ACLU. Actually, the ACLU advertised in papers in Tennessee, they said, we are looking for a teacher who's willing to challenge the Butler Act because the Butler Act said you cannot teach evolution. Okay, so this is important to know. This will be on the quiz. All the Butler Act did is outlaw the teaching of evolution. Now keep in mind, there has never been a law banning creation. There were laws banning evolution. No state has ever passed a law saying you can't teach creation. So 1925, the state of Tennessee passed the Butler Act, which said you cannot teach evolution, period. The ACLU advertised, and they said, we are looking for a teacher who is willing to challenge the Butler Act. They found a teacher named John T. Scopes. Put him on the quiz because he is a famous uh, fellow here. John T. Scopes was approached at the... Uh, drugstore in Dayton, Tennessee, which is north of Chattanooga. And by the way, there's a famous courthouse there where this trial took place, and you can still go take tours of the courthouse. I've been through it, been through Dayton many times. John Scopes was sitting around at the drugstore, and these guys came and said, would you be willing to testify that you taught evolution? And he said, well, I don't, I don't teach science. But I did substitute one day while the science teacher was gone. But I don't know if I really taught evolution or not. And they said, well, would you be willing to claim that you did? <laughs> Perjury, in other words. You know, would you lie on the witness stand? <laughs> on the witness stand. He said, well, yeah, I'd be willing to testify that I taught evolution. 
So they had him uh, uh, indicted, or whatever the word is, for teaching evolution, even though he wasn't sure he'd ever done it. And the ACLU did all this just as a test case to try to get oh, this Butler Act overturned. What they were hoping to do is get media attention. So the news media would come in, and boy, they did get a lot of that. And they wanted to make uh, creationists look stupid and evolution look great. And they wanted to use this as a chance to really push their religion of evolution. Well, as it turned out, some very famous lawyers got involved here. Clarence Darrow Clarence Darrow was the lawyer for the ACLU. He said, and he was a very famous lawyer and a skeptic, claimed to be an atheist and uh, uh, outspoken uh, atheist of that day. He said, I will come in for the ACLU and I will defend this poor teacher who is now being accused of teaching evolution. Actually, they set up the whole thing, okay? <laughs> they did it on purpose. William Jennings Bryan William Jennings Bryan said uh, he, he had three or four times been vice presidential candidate. I mean, he'd run for vice president of the United States. He was a very famous person of the day in the mid-1920s. Okay? He was um, in government in several different positions. I forget what his position was at the time, but William Jennings Bryan was an outspoken uh, advocate of creation. And he preached sermons all over the place against evolution. So William Jennings Bryan came down to Dayton, Tennessee, and he says, well, I'll take him on. I'll defend the, uh, the law, the Butler Act. And so it was quite the trial, very hot. The courtroom, they were worried the courtroom was going to collapse because so many people were crammed in there. So they moved everything outside. Plus, it was extremely hot down there in, in July, north of, uh, well, you went to school in Chattanooga, you know, in, in summer it gets pretty warm. And here they were 90 miles north in the town of Dayton. The entire court transcript, is available in a book called The World's Most Famous Court Trial. Uh, fascinating reading. As you read the book, you'll see that an awful lot of the typical lawyer type stuff, you know, bantering back and forth, selecting witnesses and all this, you have to realize the ACLU was hoping they would find him guilty. They were hoping their client would lose and then they would appeal it to a higher court so it would get nationwide attention. And as the trial went back and forth, um, Bryant, though he was a great and godly man, I've got lots of stuff on William Jennings Bryant right here. Uh, here's a book about William Jennings Bryant. If you want to read more, you can uh, come get this. And, uh, there's lots of good stuff. He was a great and godly man, but he made several serious mistakes. He said on the witness stand, I'm not sure that the earth is 6,000 years old, and I'm not sure that the days are real days. So here in 1925, he was a product of his times. He kind of believed in either the gap theory or the day-age theory. When he said that on the witness stand, most of the Christians were very disappointed in him right then. And it tells about it in the book. You know, they said, oh, you blew it right there. And, and boy, the Christians of the early 1800s and uh, all, all through the 1800s and early 1900s, they did blow it for Christianity by not standing up for the obvious truth. The Bible teaches God made the world in six days, and it adds up to about 6,000 years ago. Just There is no compromise. That's what it says, and that's what all the scientific evidence points toward. So when William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow faced off an incredible trial, it turned out Scopes was found guilty. Now during the trial, Clarence Darrow had lined up all kinds of witnesses to bring in. The witnesses were going to testify that evolution is a fact. One of the things they were going to use was the Piltdown Man. They were also going to have the uh, president of the American, uh, or the curator of the American Museum of Natural History come in. He's the one who said black people are inferior. He said the average adult Negro has the intelligence of an 11 year old white man, white boy. Well, of course, racism was, you know, 1925, there was a lot more racism in, in, in our country. The judge disallowed any evidence for evolution. See, they were hoping to use this trial to get all this evidence for evolution out there for everybody to look at. The judge said, I'm sorry, the question is not, is there evidence for evolution? The question is, did he teach it? Because the law says you can't teach it. So I don't care if there's evidence for it or not, it doesn't matter. That's not what we're here for. So the purpose of the trial was to, for the evolutionists, was to try to get notoriety and media attention for their religion, for evolution. And the judge wisely said, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter if there's any evidence. 
it, we'll throw it out. It, we're not going to, not even going to hear it. So they banter back and forth, and you can read the whole court transcript there. Finally, Scopes was found guilty of teaching evolution. Now, Darrow really was uh, uh, shrewd and slick and wicked. Uh, Darrow agreed that Brian could put him on the witness stand if he could put Brian on the witness stand. Well, that's extremely unusual for the, the lawyers to go on the witness stand, you know. Normally they're out there, you know, trying to get the witness to say some things. So sure enough, Dar Brian was put on the witness stand, and Darrow asked him all kinds of questions that he had all prepared. And then, rather than Darrow go on the witness stand and have to give evidence for evolution, he just said, Your Honor, well, we surrender, basically. I want you to find my client guilty. So Brian had this tremendous speech all prepared, and he was really going to blast uh, uh, Darrow and would have done it, but it just took all the wind out of their sails. They just couldn't do it. Brian was a huge man, over eight, you know, uh, overweight and over eight, and finally, a few days after the trial, he died of heart failure, apparently, uh, related to being overweight. So the college that started there in his honor is called Brian College in Dayton, Tennessee. They have about four or five hundred students, maybe six or seven hundred now, I don't know. Good college, some very good teachers there, uh, and they are a creationist college. Within the first, I don't know, 40 or 50 years after this trial, the teacher was found guilty. He was fined a hundred dollars. Brian offered to pay it. The fine was appealed and overturned. The next level of court said, no, I'm sorry, you made a mistake in the trial, some little technicality, the fine's overturned. So nothing ever happened. Evolution was still illegal. The Butler Act was not overturned. It was still against the law in many states to teach evolution. After the trial, a movie was made, a play was written, and then a movie was made called Inherit the Wind. Now write that down, you're going to need to know that one. Okay. Inherit the Wind is absolutely a perversion of the trial, okay? Inherit the Wind. And it has been redone several times as plays or as things like that, movies for kids for school. There's a friend of mine named George Serrell who has done extensive studies of the actual court trial, which you can get word for word transcript of the whole thing. I've got it right here. Compared it to the movie. The whole purpose of that movie is to make Christians look stupid and to make the evolutionists look brilliant. Okay, typical Hollywood stuff. And if you want to get, I've got tons and tons of material on Inherit the Wind on the movie. If that movie is showing in your public school, you ought to protest against that because that is an absolute perversion of what really happened. During this trial, though, in 1925, uh, Darrow brought up the fact, hey, evolution is in our textbook. Tennessee has already approved a textbook which contains evolution. And now you're saying you're banning the teaching of evolution. He was right. I have the textbooks they were fighting over. 1911 by Hunter, New Essentials of Biology by George W. Hunter. This is the book, 1911, that was used in Tennessee schools. Now, it doesn't have a lot of evolution in it, but it does have some. It does teach evolution. So here, Tennessee made a mistake 15 years earlier by allowing textbooks in that teach evolution. Here's what typically happens in a state, and this is the sequence that a lot of Christians and creationists don't seem to comprehend. Okay, First, the state will set standards. And this is where we've got to get involved. The state will set standards that one of the standards will be, we want evolution taught. You get a committee of, you know, five or 10 or 15 or 20 people, they set the state standards. Now, all of the textbook publishers publish books to try to sell to that state. The ones that are the most strict on this and the ones that most people really look to are the standards from Texas. I don't know why, but Texas is a real uh, place, a uh, testing ground for textbooks. So Mel Gabler in Longview, Texas has done a great job for 39 or 40 years now. He and his, his ministry, all they do is review textbooks and write critiques on them. And they rate them according to which one's the best. Texas standards are very high for textbooks. For instance, Texas standards require that if a theory is taught, the evidence for it and against it should be presented. 
The Gablers were influential in getting that in there as a Texas standard. You must teach evidence against evolution. Now Texas doesn't do it. They don't obey the law, but they're supposed to. Okay. A publisher, let's say there are 10 different publishers, just for sake of the argument, okay? The publishers will look at the different standards and they'll say, okay, by the time the kid graduates, he's supposed to know this and this and this and this and this. Let's make sure it is in our textbooks because we want to sell our books to this state. The publishers want one thing, money. Okay, they want to sell you their books. So they may, they may, they may print, you know, uh, four million textbooks. If Texas rejects them because they have mistakes, one of the things the Gablers do is just simply find out and out mistakes in the textbooks. One of them had, you know, Columbus discovering America in 1750, you know, or something like that. Just unbelievable mistakes, just crazy things in there. You know, George Washington is Abe Lincoln's vice president or something like that. You know, <laughs> just flat stuff that's wrong. Okay, thousands of things are found that are just plain wrong in the textbooks. But Texas will reject them. So here this publisher, you know, H, uh, HBJ, Harcourt Bray Shavanovich, or Prentice Hall, or whoever, they got this warehouse full of textbooks. Well, they sell them to some other state. They make a new run with the corrections for Texas, but the old ones, the ones that didn't pass, they'll sell to other states that aren't, that aren't looking, aren't watching. And this is what happens, because they don't want to get stuck with, you know, 20 million or 50 million dollars for the textbooks. So they'll sell them somewhere else. The state standards are set. Then the publishers publish books to meet the state standards. Then you have some competition. Then you have a state committee Now, 22 states have a state textbook selection committee. There are 50 states, okay? 22 of them have a state textbook selection. Florida is one of them. There's a committee that meets in Tallahassee. The committee looks at the state standards and they say, okay, the book must contain these, these things. They look over the available textbooks and let's say there are 10 publishers. Those publishers will send a sample copy to the state committee. The state committee looks over the sample copies and they will narrow it down and say, we approve you know, these three or these five. Typically it's five, but it, it, it doesn't, it's not a hard, fast rule. They approve five books that meet the state standards. They send a list of those five to every county or district. For instance, in Escambia County, there is a county school board. So at this point, the county or the district school board they will select one or two books, okay? And then they will notify all the teachers in the county, you may pick a book, pick this one or this one. Let me see your book there for a second, okay? This one had to go through this process. It was state approved, and then it, the county approved it. Then they purchased X number of thousand of them for our county, for the biology students in Scambia County. This is at Woodham, Woodham High School, okay? The basic idea is the teacher could order any textbook they wanted. They could order a Christian textbook. Your public school could order Christian textbooks, but the state won't pay for it. If you pick a book off the list we approve, then the state will pay for it. Now, a book like this probably costs 50 or $60, you know, for one book. Times how many kids in your class or how many kids use this book at your school, would you guess? 25 in your class, and how many biology classes are there? Five or six? Yeah. It's a lot of money at 60 bucks a book. And it's just one school. And there are, what, four high schools in Pensacola? Five now? Yeah, that's right. Tate and, uh, yeah. So the county then will select the book. Here's what happens then. After the book is in, in the classroom, the kid brings it home, the parents complain. And they should, okay. But we're about five steps too late. What Kansas did in uh, 98, I believe, the Kansas School Board, the Kansas, uh, Kansas has a state school board, okay, in addition to a state committee that selects books. The Kansas School Board said, our state standards will not require macroevolution to be taught. That was it. They did not say you can't teach evolution. They just said we're not going to require that macroevolution be part of the state standards. The teacher can still teach it if they want, but it's no longer required, which means it's no longer, it's no longer required to be on the tests. 
Boy, the atheists hit the ceiling. You'd have thought, you know, somebody shot them. They said, oh, the tech, this, they took evolution out of the textbooks. First, no, they didn't, okay? But if somebody believes in evolution and there is no God, they don't have any moral standards, they don't have to have any moral standards anyway. So, you know, it's okay to lie and cheat and steal, because after all, there is no God if we evolved. And if evolution is true, the toughest and meanest survive, you know, the strongest survive, the fastest lion gets the zebra. And so, you know, it's okay. As a matter of fact, it's good to get your cause accomplished any way you want. This is the typical scenario, though, that things happen. So, for most of American history, uh, teaching creation was perfectly fine and it was done in the textbooks. Laws banning evolution were introduced in 1925. Those laws were not overturned until 1968. It was against the law to teach evolution in public school in many states in America until 1968 when the last law was overturned. Now the fact is, the books taught it anyway. They were still teaching evolution even though it was against the law but nobody wanted to challenge it for fear of the, uh, a repeat of what's called the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, how it got the name Scopes Monkey Trial, I don't know, but it's the trial in Dayton, Tennessee. So, it was against the law to teach evolution. There has never been a law banning creation. Never has been. Then in 1980, Arkansas passed a law demanding equal time. The state senate in Arkansas, our state representatives and senators in Arkansas got together and said, look, if you're going to teach evolution, you must also teach creation and give it equal time. This was called the balanced treatment idea. If we're going to teach one theory, let's teach the other theory. That's what the citizens in Arkansas wanted. That's what the Congress and Senate wanted. That's what the governor wanted. Somebody challenged that law and said, this law requiring balanced treatment is a violation of the First Amendment because it lets uh, a state-sponsored, it mandates a state-sponsored religion because creation is a religious idea. Well, I think they're right. Creation is a religious idea, and now you have the state sponsoring a religion. The only problem was, the only problem with the law was they were requiring creation to be taught. The teachers already had the right to teach it. They could have taught it if they wanted. But when the Senate comes in or the Congress comes in and says, you must teach it, they cross the line. And that's what the judge said. Now, in 1987, Louisiana did the same thing. Louisiana law was written much better and I think uh, probably was, I don't know of any serious flaws in it. I read the whole thing. But Louisiana, 1987, tried the same thing. They said, you must have balanced treatment. Now, see. What they're doing, in my opinion, in both states, they worked on the wrong end of the problem. I don't think that's the way to handle this at all. Just my humble, unbiased opinion. And since this is my class, we'll just teach whatever we want, right? <laughs> Choice number one, evolution only. Choice number two, creation only. Choice number three, teach both. That's what Louisiana and Arkansas tried. The court struck it down in both cases. The Louisiana law went all the way to Supreme Court. Supreme Court struck it down, said no, you cannot require the teachers to teach creation. Choice number four, teach neither. This has been tried and tried and tried, and Christians and creationists still get excited about doing this. It's not gonna work. I'm sorry, it's not going to work. And so give it up. An awful lot of money and time and energy has been wasted. So when somebody in a local school area tries to come in to demand equal time, the atheists and evolutionists, aren't too, they're not too scared about that. They know it's not going to go anywhere. So they like keeping these Christians busy, wasting or trying to get equal time. Go ahead and write your letters, get your petitions, you know, get the parents fired up. Doesn't matter. You're wasting time. What if instead all of our effort was put into one thing? Get accurate textbooks. Require the books to be accurate. Take out the lies out of the textbooks. Now everything that supposedly supports evolution is going to vanish. 
I mean, if you took out the 27 or 28 lies we've mentioned in this, in this class that support evolution, or get the book Icons of Evolution and just simply remove the lies. Period. Now the evolution teacher is in a very unfortunate position because they get up there and say, okay kids, I believe we all came from a rock. However, I don't have any evidence. Starts to look pretty silly. But the way they're doing it now is they're saying, kids, I believe we came from a rock and here's the evidence. Bang, bang, bang. And one by one. Those things have all been proven wrong, but they're still in there. It all is based on the idea that the Earth is billions of years old, and it's not, and if you can prove that wrong, that destroys evolution. So I think step by step we need to challenge the statements in the textbooks that are not accurate. Simple. Um, <clears throat> Arkansas is uh, working on a law right now. A couple of representatives called me last week, and they want me to uh, read the law before they present it that's going to require uh, that the state will not fund, the state will not pay for any books that contain false information. Great. Who can argue against that? And if they'll follow through on it, that's the thing. Okay. So there are many good impact articles that deal with this subject of the laws in the uh, 1980 and 1987 Louisiana law uh, that required balanced treatment. So we need to have a quiz question. What were they asking for in Arkansas and Louisiana? They're asking for balanced treatment and the court struck it down. They said you cannot do that. Basically, the whole purpose, the, the whole point of all this was they, you're not allowed to require this. And how people didn't catch on, I don't know. Even guys like Stephen Jay Gould, who's the Marxist professor at Harvard University. Stephen Gould said after the Louisiana trial, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before and it can be taught now. Uh, Michael Zimmerman said, the Supreme Court ruling did not in any way outlaw the teaching of creation science in public school classrooms. Quite simply, it ruled that in the form taken by the Louisiana law, it is unconstitutional to demand equal time for this particular subject. Creation science can still be brought into classrooms if and when the teachers and administrators feel it is appropriate. Numerous surveys have shown that teachers and administrators favor just this route. And in fact, creation science is being taught in science courses throughout the country. The Supreme Court's decision says that only that the Louisiana law violates the Constitution of separation, constitutional separation of church and state. It does not say no one can teach scientific creationism, and unfortunately many individual teachers do. Some schools, districts even require equal time for, teach, for creation and evolution. This is what Eugenia Scott said after the decision. I debated Eugenia Scott on the radio uh, when I was in Boston one time, she was in California. Her, whole organ, her entire organization, the National Center for Science Education, their whole organization exists to keep creation out of schools. Funded by one of the guys in the late 1800s, not Rockefeller, but one of the other uh, rich guys started this organization with a grant to keep evolution in the textbooks and creation out. So they've got their own website, uh, NSCS, um, I think, dot, uh, oh, there it is on the screen there. National Center for Science Education.org, NET, whatever abbreviation, you can look it up there on the internet. And they will instruct people, they say, don't debate creationists because you probably lose. They'll say creationists are professional debaters. They're trained in how to do this. <laughs> I've never had a course on debate in my life. And I think the creationists win because they're right and the evolutionists are wrong. I mean, that's why we win. It's not nothing complicated about it. William Provine said, Teachers and school boards in public schools are already free under the Constitution of the USA to teach about supernatural origins if they wished in their science classes. Laws can be passed in most counties of countries of the world requiring discussions of supernatural origins in science classes and still satisfy national legal requirements. And I have a suggestion for evolutionists. Include discussions of supernatural origins in your classes and promote discussion of them in public and other schools. Come off your high horse about having only evolution taught in science class. The exclusionism you uh, promote is painfully self-serving and smacks of elitism. Why are you afraid of confronting the supernatural creationism believed by the majority of persons in the USA and perhaps the worldwide? Good question. Now this guy believes in evolution, okay, and he teaches it to his students. But he says, look, we ought to teach both, perfectly fine. Provine went on to say, shouldn't, shouldn't students be encouraged to express their beliefs about origins in a class discussing origins by evolution? Sure. 
one lady wrote me, a public school teacher said, or one fellow wrote me and said, Mr. Hoven, I'm a public school science teacher. I went to a conference today and we were all given a new science textbook <coughs> to use in the conference. It is called The Sciences by uh, whatever that publisher is, John Wiley and Sons. On page 611, it said this, to what extent do you think that parents should have the right to decide which scientific theories and ideas are presented in schools? To what extent do you think parents ought to have the right to demand that opposing religious views be taught as well? Should the views of creationism, which are primarily based on one particular type of Christianity, be given special consideration? It's getting more difficult to teach the truth, to say the truth, all the time. You know what this is doing? This is trying to let the science teachers, this is brainwashing is what it is for the science teachers. They're teaching the teachers, well, you know, creationism is only based on the Bible. In the first place, is that true? No. No. The idea that there's a creator is based on the obvious. I mean, look around, okay? <laughs> there was a creator. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. I often get emails from atheists. I get, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 a day probably that I have to respond back to. And they'll say something like, you know, creation, evolution is a proven fact. And, you know, how can you believe there's a God type emails? I get those all the time. And one of my responses is, do you need to light a candle to see the sun? I mean, look around, there's evidence for design everywhere you look. Every little molecule is designed. Every atom is designed. The proteins are designed. Every cell in your body is designed. You got 50 trillion cells in your body, each one is more complicated than New York City. You think this happened by chance? Well, if you want to believe that, that's fine, but don't call that science. That's a religious worldview. Uh, the ICR has a great impact article, uh, impact article number 196, they're like 10 cents a piece, okay? If, if you want to get back issues. You could call them and order a thousand and pass out to your uh, community or pass out in your school, you know. Let the teachers know, look, you can teach creation science. I think we have <coughs> a problem because so many teachers have been brainwashed into thinking they can't. When actually, it's perfectly fine to teach creation science. All right, let's take a little break here. When we come back, we'll cover more on what to do about what's going on in our schools and textbooks. Okay, let's continue now. Some things you can do to fix the problem in your local area, in your school. Okay? You can start a Bible class right in your public school. Elizabeth Ridenauer will help you do that. Her phone number and address is right here. She has helped get Bible classes started in public schools all across America. There are now over 150,000 students studying the Bible in public school from her curriculum. I met with her well, several months ago when I was preaching in North Carolina. And she's a great lady and will help you get a Bible class started <coughs> if you'd like to do that. Um, you might want to get the book by uh, Dwayne Gish. We sell it to our ministry for five bucks, Teaching Creation Science in a Public School. Now he very carefully distinguishes between creation science and biblical creationism. Teaching creation science says, look, the scientific evidence says there must have been a creator. Teaching biblical creationism says, God made the world 6,000 years ago. The first man was Adam. His wife's name was Eve. You know, that kind of stuff probably is not, uh, should not be taught in a school. Uh, certainly, <coughs> that's a tough question to answer, but there's a difference between teaching biblical creationism and teaching scientific creationism. The fact is, the evidence is overwhelming. There must have been a designer. Mel Gabler said, states can legally require teachers to discuss evolution. They cannot require them to discuss creation. Teachers may discuss creation if they wish, but the states cannot require them. The Gablers are uh, great friends in this, uh, in this battle against the evolution theory. You can contact them. Their website is txbk, for textbook, reviews, R-E-V-W-S, uh, at AOL.com. So you can get a hold of, that's their email, get a hold of the uh, uh, Gablers or their phone number here on the screen in Longview, Texas. The courts allow states to require discussing scientific weaknesses in evolution, but not require discussing creation. So a state could pass a law that requires the weaknesses of a theory to be taught. Texas did that, but they're not enforcing it. What would have to happen is somebody would have to get on the county textbook selection committee, somebody like a bulldog that says, look, I'm, I'm hanging on, I'm not letting go. And you just simply say, these books do not match the state standards. The state standards require weaknesses. The book doesn't present weaknesses. If they buy the book anyway, then they ought to be sued for breaking the law. 
The problem in this battle, as I see it, is most Christians are too nice to sue people. We'd let them poison our kids rather than stop them, you know? <laughs> and it's time we do something about it, in my humble opinion. Back in 1963, a Supreme Court uh, was, I think this was the case where they're taking prayer out of the schools with William Murray, Madeleine Murray O'Hare. Uh, if not, it was one of the cases shortly thereafter. But the court held in 1963, the, it certainly may be said the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or of religion, when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education, may be affected consistently with the First Amendment. In uh, 1980, the Eighth Circuit Court ruled, I'm sorry, this was the U.S. Supreme Court, okay? Supreme Court said, the Bible may constitutionally be used in an appropriate study of history, civilization, ethics, comparative religion, or the like. So, in uh, 1980, the Eighth Circuit Court said, you can, the school um, can use the Bible because it will enhance the student's knowledge and appreciation of the role of that our religious heritage played in the social, cultural, and historical development of civilization. But if you go check your textbooks now, any mention of Christianity has been stripped out. You might find two pages on Marilyn Monroe and two sentences on George Washington. It is unbelievable what's happened in the textbooks. They're being rewritten to play down Christianity and to emphasize all sorts of things that they have toward, as part of their plan toward a new world order. Um, in 1987, Supreme Court ruled, teachers already possess the flexibility to present a variety of scientific theories about human origins of humankind. They are free to teach any and all facets of the subject. Teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind to school children might be done with a clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction. This is the case that Stephen Gould commented on and said, look, it's, the courts have never banned creation. There were laws banning evolution, but they've never banned creation. California State School Board, their policy is, discussions of any scientific fact, hypothesis, or theory related to the origins of the universe the earth and of life, that's the how, are appropriate to the science curriculum. So I would encourage Christians to realize, look, it's perfectly fine. Now there are several ways to fight this battle. The way Jesus did it, Jesus did not spend much time trying to change the Roman Empire. Most of his effort was reaching individuals. The simplest and I think the foolproof way, number one, is go after souls, win souls, and Teach them the truth, just like Jesus said. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. After you get them saved, teach them, or baptize them, and then teach them to do everything I told you to do. That's unstoppable. We probably will never change the textbooks in our county, though I think we should try. But if we got every kid in your class converted to believing in creation, or to being a Christian, or both, it doesn't matter what they're teaching. They're not going to believe it. Right? Second level... And I think this needs to be a multi-pronged attack, but the second level is go after the teachers. Many teachers uh, are already Christians. They just simply don't know what their rights are. So if we inform the teachers of what their rights are, or inform them of the truth of creation, see, curriculum really starts when the classroom door shuts. Very few teachers ever make it all the way through the textbook in the year anyway. Do you guys skip chapters in yours? Sure. And with some textbooks, it's easier to skip the whole chapter because they put all the evolution stuff in one chapter. Other textbook authors spread it through everything. Uh, Merrill Science, several times, has put all the evolution stuff in one or two chapters, and the teacher can just say, okay, we're going to skip this. And it doesn't play into most of the rest of the textbook. Level three is go after the whole school. Get the principal or the school board in the area or something to say, look, let's you know, get this out of the textbooks. Let's fix, let's fix this problem. I think we need to approach work on this, but most of my effort, and I think most of Jesus' effort, was on the individuals. That way, it doesn't matter what the rest of them are doing. So uh, there's a, class, a, a great video on what's happening in public school classrooms, not only on evolution, but on sex education and all sorts of other things, available from Eagle Forum. That's Phyllis Schlafly's organization in... Uh, Alton, Illinois. Now, Phyllis Schlafly is a Catholic. I would disagree with her on several major doctrines, but she's done it. She's a constitutional lawyer, and she's done a great job of defending the Christians' rights in, um, in schools. Okay, 
Some people say, what about separation of church and state? There is no such phrase used in the Constitution. That sentence, separation of church and state, was written in a letter by Thomas Jefferson to a Baptist pastor in 1802. It is not part of the Constitution. The, the wall of separation between church and state is to keep the state from getting involved in the church's business. Peter Kershaw has a great book, which we sell both of his books through our ministry. One is called Hush Money. The other is called uh, In Caesar's Grip. Hush Money is the shortened version. In Caesar's Grip is the long version. They are awesome books about how churches have really blown it by becoming 501c3 corporations. That's one of the dumbest things a church could do because now you're asking the government for permission to exist. And God already told you what to do. It's a matter of, you know, who is sovereign anyway? And they have taken church and put it under the government. Major, major mistake. And we'll get into more of that later. Impact article number 278, available from Institute for Creation Research, icr.org, uh, is about a fellow in North Carolina. I talked to Steve Deckard. He uh, teaches at a, it's not a Baptist school, it's a Christian school of, I think, Plymouth Brethren or some other denomination up in North Dakota, not North Carolina, North Dakota or South Dakota, I forget. Anyway, he rated all the textbooks based on how much um, evolution do they have in them. His rating of the 1991 textbooks said biology by Merrill and everyday experience had only 2.9% of the words in the textbook were talking about evolution. The rest is just talking about biology like it's supposed to, okay? HBJ, uh, the yellow version, had 15.6%. It was the worst. And here's the rating here of the textbooks. Now, that's not going to be the same every year. This doesn't mean that Merrill is always the best. Okay? It varies greatly from year to year. I encourage people to get, a, a science teachers, to get the book of Pandas and People. We sell it through our ministry or you can get it uh, off the internet. But that book is a supplemental biology textbook written from the perspective of there must have been an intelligent designer called the Design Perspective. Now. One of the authors of this book is Dean Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-Y, Kenyon, A-N, A-N, I think. Dean Kenyon teaches in San Francisco, and he was an evolutionist. He wrote books about evolution, and he got converted. He had already taught for 20 years. It was either Stanford or San Francisco State, I forget where he taught, but someplace in the Bay Area. Um, they fired him for teaching his students that evolution was questionable. He sued them because, hey, he said, I've been teaching her 20 years. I'm tenured. You can't just fire me. And they had a big deal over that big, <laughs> big lawsuit on all that. And finally, he was reinstated as a lab assistant. Well, normally, college juniors and seniors get the job of lab assistant, you know, clean up the test tubes when everybody's done. They, I, my understanding is finally, after a great legal battle, they put him back in, in a classroom, but they've tried everything they can to keep students out from under his influence. Because they think his evil influence is going to encourage them to not believe in evolution. So that's one example. We've got lots more we'll get into when we get into the question answer session. I've added a whole several pages of people who have been discriminated against because of their religious belief. And we've encouraged you, you might want to get the book uh, Icons of Evolution if you want more. This guy rates the textbooks. He gives them an A, B, C, D, or F based upon how they handle the 15 different icons of evolution, like the gill slits. I gave them all an F, I think, because they all mention it. It's been proven wrong 126 years ago. Okay? Uh, the horse evolution. How do they handle this? First, he goes through all the law, all the, all the evidence and says, look, it's been proven wrong, it's been proven wrong, it's been proven wrong. How does this textbook handle it? So he rated quite a few textbooks based upon how they handle these different lies that have been proven wrong. I mean, everybody knows they're wrong, but why do they still present it? I think most of them got F in every category. A couple of them got a D in a few categories. <laughs> <laughs> so the choice this year for your textbooks is strychnine or arsenic. You know, which do you prefer? Here's the Gabler's uh, in book that we, we also sell through our ministry. What are they teaching our children? A great book. It's only $4. You can get that and give it out to people for uh, people involved in education. I'll give the Gablers a call. They will be glad to help you in textbook selection. If you get on the textbook selection committee in your area, you're going to be overwhelmed because all these publishers send you these books. You know, please buy our book. You don't have time to read them all. 
Gablers have already done it. Get on that committee and say, call right to the Gablers and say, look, now they work on a donation basis, okay? Write to the Gablers and say, here's 200 bucks or here's $300 or whatever. Please send us your, your evaluation of these books. Because it's going to cost them, you know, to print the pages and to send them to you and all that kind of stuff, plus their staff they have there. So I would encourage you to do that. That's uh, crsc.org has a uh, rating of textbooks also. The Gablers wrote me this letter uh, in, in the 2000 and they said, Dear Dr. Oven, thank you for using What Are They Teaching Our Children? You'll be interested to know that in our 39 years of work, we have never seen publishers so sensitive or schools so receptive to our textbook reviews and ranking. See, what the Gablers do is they review all the textbooks and rank them. This one's the best, this one's the worst. They don't recommend anybody buy one or not buy one. They just rank them according to best to worst in their opinion, and they send that ranking sheet all over Texas to school boards. School boards look at this ranking sheet sort of like consumer reports, you know. They're the consumer reports of textbooks. For instance, one thing they do is they rank them on just how many inaccuracies do they have. How many things are in here that are just flat wrong, okay? And every textbook has mistakes, I'm sure, but some have lots and lots of mistakes. And so they rank them and then, of course, the, this greatly affects sales. So the publishers now are calling, getting hold of the Gabler saying, okay, we're sorry, what would you like in the books anyway? You know, <laughs> took them 39 years to get where they are, but I would encourage you to uh, uh, take advantage of what they do because they are a great asset to the Christian. He went on to say, we're also pleased to recommend the Harcourt and Scott Forsman Elementary Science Series. They are much less dogmatic on evolution than the others we reviewed. So why reinvent the wheel? These folks are doing it, you know. Take advantage of what they're doing. They also do a lot of work with the history books. Um, Mr. Fry, I forget his first name now, works with the Gablers. Yeah. He's not Gary Fry, it's a different Fry. But he is an um, incredibly intelligent man. And he, he reads all these history books and finds mistakes. You know, that's the wrong date here, that's the wrong date there, and, you know, and just loads these books down with, it says, look, we can't buy this book because it's, it's inaccurate. Okay? Adolf Hitler is quoted as saying, let me control the textbooks and I will control the state. How many kids go through your class at uh, Woodham High School and believe what they're taught? Probably all of them. They should be able to, shouldn't they? Shouldn't the kid be able to go to class, read the book, listen to the teacher, and believe it? I mean, you don't need to be a genius to figure this out. That's the way it's supposed to be in school. So what can we do to help fix the problem? Bert Wagner, uh, here's his uh, address or email and uh, phone number. BERT can help you get creation materials into your public school libraries. Many public schools in their public school library or even in the public libraries have nothing about creation. Nobody has pushed to get it in there. Get some videotapes. He's gotten my videotapes into many public school libraries. And we probably get a call or letter, an average of one a week, from somebody, a student or a parent getting saved from watching one of my videos that they checked out of their public school library. Now, some schools, some people have called me and said, I've tried and I can't get them in. Bert knows how to do it. There's red tape you got to cut through. He can do it, okay? He can get the stuff in there. Some practical things to do. You can demand that pages with false information be cut out. That doesn't cost anything. You could probably find 100 volunteers in your church or in your area who would help cut the pages out. Now, if you're asking for pages with lies to be cut out, is that trying to get the Bible in? Is that trying to get creation in? No, I'm just trying to get the poison out of the books, that's all. Who can argue with that? You've got to have them glue the pages together. Somebody called me and said, Brother Hovind, a principal in our town in Georgia, I forget what town now, over the summer found the pages with false information and glued them together. That fall, the NEA hit the ceiling. That's the National Teachers Association, the National Education Association. They said, you can't do that. He said, well, I did. They said, but you can't. He said, well, I did. It's, it's done, over with. The glue dried. Okay, it's too late. <laughs> Just do it, okay? Get the stuff out of there. You can put a warning sticker in the front cover. Alabama, Becky, uh, you know where the warning stickers are in the drawer out there? Alabama, Martha has a file. Make a note, let's give one of those to each of the students here in the class. And uh, probably if we have enough, let's, uh, as people take this course, let's maybe send one with them. That's a, Alabama requires that sticker to be put in the front of every book. 
If the book discusses evolution, it must have a warning sticker. Like a pack of cigarettes, you know, warning, this has been determined to be hazardous to your health. Textbooks that teach evolution ought to have this warning sticker. Now, Alabama requires it, but they don't all do it. Because some of the Christians in Alabama are too, too worried about who wins that dumb ball game, and they're not paying attention to what's going on in their schools. But they ought to be suing the schools if they don't obey the law. Put, put that stuff in there. I put that sticker in there. You might want to get my little brainwash booklet. We update this very regularly. Um, <clears throat> if you buy them in quantity, they're a dollar a piece. That's our printing cost, okay? You could get these brainwashed booklets and buy one for every student in your school and give one to every kid in class. Many people have done this. One guy ordered 500, passed them out to the whole school up in, uh, I think, Minnesota, if I recall. And he said the teachers are having an awful time because every time they bring up something on evolution, 10 of the kids will say, oh, excuse me, uh, that was proven wrong back in, you know, blah, blah, blah. Why is it still in their books, you know? If you get an educated student body, it's going to be real frustrating on somebody who tries to push off a lie on them. Which goes back to, number one, let's reach them person by person, one by one. All right? Florida has a law requiring textbooks to be accurate. It's Florida Statute 233.09. Florida Statute has this law that says all instructional materials recommended by each council for use in the schools shall be to the satisfaction of each council accurate. Anybody see a problem with this? The books have to be accurate as long as the council thinks they're accurate. That sentence ought to be stricken from the law. Textbooks ought to be accurate, period. Because the way this is written, all you have to do is get you know a majority of the council to think something is good when it's not. And uh, we're stuck with it. That's what's happened in, uh, in Florida here. It's uh, sad to say that law needs to be rewritten. So some of you congressmen and senators in my watch this state, fix it for me, please. All right, That's your job. Uh, in Texas, uh, Title 19, Education 66.66I uh, or L, I don't remember, says instructional materials shall, be, shall present the most factual information accurately and objectively without editorial opinion or bias by the authors. Theories shall be clearly distinguished from facts and presented in an objective manner. Well, that's the Texas law, but Texas doesn't do it. So some folks in Texas ought to go to their school and say, look, you're not obeying the law. Would you like to fix this, or should we go to court and talk about this? I don't know, I don't, I don't know of any cases where evolution has ever been taken to court. Creation has been on the witness stand where they had to defend creation. If evolution had to be defended, it would lose. But nobody ever approaches it that way. Look, evolution is a lie. If you have some evidence for it, I'd like to see it. If you don't have any evidence for it, then quit teaching it. Get it out of the textbooks, okay? In uh, Wisconsin, Administrative Code 361 says the textbooks shall have factual accuracy. Well, if you're teaching the kid we have gill slits, that's not accurate. Okay, <laughs> Cut the page out of the book. Now in Alabama, here's part of that sticker. Alabama Code 1975 says uh, adequate textbooks provide all students in the public schools shall be provided with adequate and current textbooks. One might argue that textbooks that contain statements and examples that are proven to be false and fraudulent are neither adequate nor current. Here's the sticker. This textbook discusses evolution, a controversial theory some scientists present as a scientific explanation for the origin of living things. No one was present when life first appeared on Earth. Therefore, any statements about life's origins should be considered as theory, not a fact. Microevolution, which can be described as a fact, it discusses that in the, in the sticker, I shortened it here, and macroevolution has never been observed and should be called a theory. Stephanie Bell on the Alabama State School Board, I believe, is the one responsible for pushing this through. And she did a great job. Here's her phone number if you want help to do it in your state. Okay, get a hold of Stephanie and say, what can I do? All right, California code requires textbooks shall be factually accurate and incorporate principles of instruction reflective of current and confirmed research. Well, should they include the gill slits? Should they include the horse evolution? Should they include the tailbone being vestigial? How the appendix being vestigial? Look, the, many states already have the laws. We just have to require that they be enforced. Okay. 
do something about it. Let's fix it. You might want to get students this little booklet, uh, Students' Legal Rights. We offer it through our ministry. It's like 10 bucks. It's, uh, you can get a hold of ACLJ, American Center for Law and Justice. That's uh, Jay Seculo's organization in Atlanta. Uh, or, um, see Atlanta or Virginia Beach? A ACLJ, Virginia Beach. Um, their organization will help uh, in, in defending Christians who are discriminated against because of their religion. This book, though, on page 53, uh, tells students you have the right to be exempt from anything against your religion. You could go down to the school board at Woodham High School or go down to the principal and say, it has to be in writing, I do not want my son taught thing, I do not want my, my, want my son taught evolution. Period. Notarize it. My secretary is a notary. Bring it in. We'll notarize your statement. Give it to them. They have to then exempt him from that class. Now, they'll give him other material. You don't just get out of work and go to study hall, okay? But um, suppose 70% of the class is, does that. Teacher gets up. There's going to be a section on evolution. All the kids say, oh, I need to be excused. And they're standing out in the hall. It won't take them too long to figure out, you know, we really ought to skip this section because nobody's here anyway, <laughs> right? Students ought to be informed here. You have the right to do this. If you don't know your rights, you might as well not have them. If people just knew their rights and stood up for what, what, was, what was right, one guy gets stopped by police officers. He'll say, oh, am I being arrested? No. Well, then am I free to go? No. Oh, then I'm being arrested. Arrested means stopped. No, you're not arrested. Well, then can I go then? <laughs> Just back and forth like that. I don't know if you want to do all that or not, but that's what he does. Now, here's some pitfalls to watch out for. If a school is going to have a good program, I speak in lots of public schools, very frequently they will make it an opt-in. In other words, the kid has to take a note home and get it signed or else they can't come to the program. And how many kids take a note home and forget to bring it back? We had, uh, what was his name today, sitting there, came over to visit today, five, four years old, has a note pinned on the back of his shirt. That way it's sure to get home and you're sure to get back. You know, pin it on the back. The kid forgets he's got it back there. <laughs> How many notes did you forget to get signed and get in trouble for? Lots, Lots of them, right. Um, See, so they always make it an opt-in program. If, if the bad guys don't want the kids to hear this, but the school's going to have this program anyway, let's, let's make sure the kids have to, make it hard for the kids to go see this. Now, if it's going to be an, a bad program, if they're going to have a homosexual come speak on, you know, a queer lifestyle or something, they will make sure it is an opt-out program. In other words, everybody has to come unless you have a note not to come. Now, that is totally unfair, but that's the way it happens. And we ought to be up in arms and say, look, we're not going to allow that at this school. Let's have a level playing field. Okay? Everybody ought to be... Uh, now, these ought to all be the same. None of this opt-in, opt-out kind of stuff. Now, kids, let me encourage you, if you go to public school, don't confront your teacher publicly if possible. Okay? Talk to them after class. No teacher responds well to a public confrontation in front of their students. Number two, if you're late to class frequently or the troublemaker or the goof-off in class, if you don't do your homework and you don't pay attention, please don't tell them you're a Christian. Okay? You are <laughs> you're not helping. You should be a good student. I recommend you do this. If a test question comes up, for instance, in this biology book that you have, you know the answer that they want from the book because you've done your homework, right? <clears throat> you can simply say, the textbook says, blah, 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 blah. However, this is not correct and has been proven wrong, you know. Preach to them. Now, this way, the teacher knows, hey, I learned it, but I didn't swallow it. They can require you to learn it. They can't require you to believe it. When I became a Christian, a sophomore year in high school, I was in English class. My English teacher was evil, wicked, vile, godless, okay? And always giving us assignments to write, and kids would write just really bad stuff, you know? I decided, hey, I'm going to write all papers on Christianity, how to get saved. I would try, it didn't matter what the assignment was. I would try to twist it around and get the gospel in there somehow. Okay? And then I asked Tom, who sat next to me, I said, Tom, would you proofread my paper for me? It's due tomorrow. Tom Pisano, you preached at his church. Reading all my English papers my sophomore year in high school, got Tom interested in the gospel. Tom came to church with me and got saved. 
Then Tom brought his neighbor and his best friend John with him to church, and John got saved, and John and I went off to Bible college together. Tom ended up, he's now pastoring a church. I've preached there and you've preached there, right? Tom Pisano in, uh, in East Peoria, Illinois, pre core Illinois. It's from that English class, okay? So, learn the material, but do not swallow it. You can ask to be exempt. Of course, you have this legal right to do that. I think some practical steps to follow. You can give your teacher a video to watch at home. Video is a great way to get people converted. People, especially men, okay? When they're sitting at home holding the remote, the power. the power, the feeling of power comes over them, okay? Nobody's been able to give it a word yet, but there's got to be a name for this. But there's a real, how many know what I'm talking about, okay? That feeling of power that you get when you're holding the remote control. Men will get saved watching a videotape that you would never get to come to church. Teachers will get converted by watching a video that you never would have got to church. You can invite people to a creation seminar. There are scores of creation scientists speaking all over the country all the time. I speak 700 times a year. I'm probably going to be in your town eventually. Okay, so watch my website, drdino.com, or watch the website from ICR. They send out four or five different speakers. Frank Riddle is a great guy. I uh, spoke to many, he's been to our house here a couple times. He speaks for ICR, goes out and travels. Frank Sherwin used to live here in Pensacola and uh, taught at Pensacola Christian College. He came and did a lot of video ta or audio taping here with me, uh, broadcasts on creation evolution. He called himself Haas Nonum, has no name, because he didn't want to get fired at the school for you know coming over here. A long story there. <laughs> anyway, um, there are great speakers out there speaking on creation science. Invite you know some of your teachers or schools to some of these seminars. Schedule a debate in your area. The student uh, in Pennsylvania, I talked to him today, Joe Baker. One junior student or senior, junior I think he is, got, is fired up on creation. I mean, real fired up. He scheduled me to come speak at his high school. The auditorium seats about 900 or 1100. 1500 were in the auditorium. I mean, seated all down the aisles, lined down the aisles, all across the back, and they turned away over 300 people. They wouldn't let them in. The principal was about to pull his hair out. He said, the fire marshal is going to throw me in jail for the rest of my life. You know? The one high school kid did that. Scheduled the whole thing. Arranged it. Promoted it. He would put up posters all over the campus. He'd go back an hour later and they're all torn down, so he'd put up more. People going behind him, tearing down the posters. Yeah, it was really, and there is still a battle in that school. But that one meeting, I just flew up for one day and flew back home. All I had, that's all I had time to schedule. Couldn't go for a whole weekend, you know. But um, anybody can do that. You can have your teachers call me with any questions. Okay, I talk to teachers a lot. We've had thousands of teachers. You can look through our testimony file. We've had thousands of teachers get converted to be creationists from watching our material. You can watch Ken Ham's material. He's got great stuff, or ICR, or there's others out there speaking on creation, okay? Get them to come. Get your teacher to show a creation video in class. Teachers need to learn what students learn early in life. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Okay, don't ask if you can do it, just do it, all right? Many people have told me they show my videos in their class and the kids love it. They don't ask it. The farther up the chain you go to for get to permission, the less likely you are to get it. Because those people up there got the higher salaries and they got to watch their backside, make sure nobody, you know, they don't want to lose that cush job they have, so they don't want to rock the boat in any way. So just flat do it, all right? You could run for school board. Anybody could do that. Get on the school board. You could require that they teach... Uh, that they teach the truth and get enforce the laws that are already probably on the books. Get on your curriculum committee. Some of you could get on the state textbook selection committee. Well, I've erased it now, but man, make make the laws, make the uh, state requ requirements reasonable to get this stuff out. Bible says, "The fear of man bringeth a snare." We need to get some people that just say, "I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do what's right." I think. A logical step is convert the students, one at a time. You could write letters to the editor. Everybody ought to be doing that. That's what started my whole ministry here. I came to Pensacola, started writing letters to the editor about creation and evolution. Nearly all of them are in my seminar notebook. You can read my original letters that I wrote to the Pensacola newspaper. I started getting calls saying, hey, could you come speak at our place on creation? 
You could donate some books to your library, to public library, school library, get some creation material in there. I think we need to be using creation as a means of evangelism. It is a great way to do it. In the book of Acts, there are two great sermons. Acts chapter 2, Peter preached to the Jews on Mars Hill. The Jews are very, very familiar with Scripture. He quoted Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. That's what they're used to. Acts chapter 17, Paul's preaching on Mars Hill to a bunch of heathen who don't know about Scripture, never heard of it, and don't care. He never quoted any Bible verses. He talked about creation. Paul said in Acts 17, I want to talk to you about the unknown God. God that made the world starts right off with creation. Have you seen the movie Etau? Remember that? The missionaries go to, and they, they, they go to this tribe of folks and they've never seen a white man, you know, and they just start with, start with the gospel. By, they give them the gospel by starting in Genesis. Teach the whole Bible story. A great way to get folks who have no concept of Christianity to understand how it all fits together. I think creation evangelism is the need of the 20th and 21st century, in my humble opinion. Romans chapter 1 says, The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So they are without excuse. Nobody's going to have an excuse and say, oh, I didn't believe, I believed in evolution because I didn't see any evidence for a creator. There is overwhelming evidence for a creator. Okay, that's some practical things you can do. Now, next week, we're going to start talking about what this evolution theory has done for the world. The effects of teaching this theory. We've been teaching so far, what's on my videotape number four, the lies in the textbooks. The fact is they're still being taught. They're going to be taught tomorrow in your classroom. I'm giving you some practical things to do about it. But now I want to talk about what effect does this have? How is this theory of evolution influence the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, the New World Order. You fellows in the military, most of the threat we've had for the last 50 years or 70 years has been from communism. All of that's based on evolution. You were raised in Ukraine, you know, so were you. You were born over there, right? You were born over here? California. Your parents were raised in Ukraine. You were born in Ukraine. Soviet and co former communist countries, all of communism and all of the suffering and everything they've gone through, I, I'm convinced is all because of this theory of evolution. We're going to cover how the evolution theories led to the rise of Adolf Hitler. Nazism is based solidly on this same idea. See, ideas have consequences. What you believe determines how you behave. If you're raised in a headhunting society, where they, you know, cannibal society, like the book Peace Child, excellent book, by the way. Um, if you teach your kids from the time they're born, hey, boy, kids, now listen, when we go to war and you fight against the enemies, if you kill one of them, be sure to cut his head off and eat his brains because then you will get his spirit and you'll be twice as strong. Well, of course, that's not true, but if the kid's taught that from the time he's little, guess what he's going to do when he goes to battle and kills somebody? <laughs> he's going to do what he was taught. Ideas have serious consequences. And this evolution is not just a dumb theory, it's a dangerous philosophy. We're going to start on that. It'll be very politically incorrect, I assure you, starting next week. Thank you so much.